My name is Mandy Vaughn. I'm the president of Vox Space. Vox Space is a subsidiary company spun off from Virgin Orbit. And he wants you over there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so no, I've got some a couple interesting things that I want to bring up for kind of to continue the themes from the discussion through the day. I think we've got a lot of interesting themes, and I've really been enjoying the the conversation. It is a little tough. Uh, I think in this forum, we're right after lunch, and then also I'm up against a panel of artists. So like, okay, at the Media Lab, I kind of know where the draw is going to be. So I think the only I think the the one. Op opening statement here, at least um, to compete with going up against artists, is at least our spaceship is really beautiful. It is a work of art unto itself, right? So the spaceship and the White Knight vehicles, if you're ever in Mojave, it, they really are gorgeous. So we, and which is kind of an interesting part of one of the first things I want to bring up with, with uh, human spaceflight and what Virgin Galactic is really doing to open up human spaceflight. So the things I'll hit on today are really kind of what we've been talking about all morning on, on normalizing access to space and democratizing access to space. And the Virgin family of companies were doing this first through, through the passenger, the tourism business, really opening space for everybody, not just the classic stereotypical astronaut, but then also on where I spend more of my time on the small satellite side. Uh, how can we open up space for small satellites, enabling these new businesses like you heard from, from Robbie from Planet, earlier and how to what is our element of building that infrastructure to enable that that new part of the ecosystem and then kind of third what is the business prospect associated with that what do we have to do both from this chain with the passenger stuff as well as the small sat small satellite launch market how can we start to change some of the paradigms with how we can change business and truly then enable that ecosystem. So I think we're really just on the verge of this. And this really is the opening access and opening space is really Virgin's mission across this family of companies, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so on the people side, like I mentioned, so it's not just your typical classic astronaut, you've wanted to spend your whole life and this is the pinnacle of your career. The whole purpose of opening this, the spaceship program for, for really for tourism is to enable anybody to go. Poets, writers, the artists across the street in the other hallway, right? So how can we inspire anybody to go? And then when they get back from that trip, what does that mean? How have they changed? How will they then change the world? So and we do this in a pretty different way. The architecture of the system is not a classic rocket experience. So here's a picture of the spaceship on its carrier aircraft. The carrier aircraft is called the White Knight 2. This is the most recent space flight just two weeks ago. Uh, so we take off like an airplane. So your astronauts are sitting in seats in, inside the spaceship, sitting in flight suits. Um, made by Under Armour now, I guess, which is kind of cool. Um, and you have a couple hour flight to altitude. So this again is very much more airplane-like. Once they get up to altitude, which can be a pretty neat flight, uh, this is actually a picture that the pilots took from the White Knight fuselage of the spaceship over the Sierra Nevadas. This was from a separate flight, but I just love the picture. Um, so you've got your flight up to altitude, and then at about 50,000 feet, spaceship is released from the White Knight. Um, but in more actuality, the White Knight bounces off the top of the spaceship. Uh, so it drops for a few seconds, ignites the engine, and off it goes into space for a suborbital flight. Um, usually about four or five minutes of zero gravity that you'll get to experience. The passengers can get out of their seats and float around the cabin and look out windows on the side as well as on the top of the vehicle. And when you're in space, this is kind of the, oh, this is from the last, uh, last flight where we actually carried a passenger. So we had our, our pilot and co-pilot, and then we also had Beth Moses. She is the chief astronaut instructor for Virgin Galactic. So she was uh, riding along in the back along with some NASA payloads, which is pretty cool. And so she got to experience getting in and out of the seat. How well does that go? Handholds, how easy was the experience? So she's really, awesome test driving experience. Um, so she got to ride along on this one. And this is an example of some of the views from space. This was on that last mission from the tail boom camera. Uh, 
And so this is also then you can see what's unique about the spaceship. This is when it's in its feathered configuration. So at this point, then it really reconfigures the whole aircraft really into a, a, a spacecraft at this point. So then it really it reenters more like a, a capsule than an airplane. So it starts its, its trip back down and then finally reconfigures into an aircraft and glides in to land just like an airplane. So we're really changing what is going to be the experience of flying in space. But again, that human connection back to it, it's what do they then do when they're back from this awesome trip? Um, so we have, what, 700 people or so that have signed up to, take the, to start flying uh, when we enter commercial operations. So very interesting in terms of what can we do from this and what's next? Can, can this go into uh, what are lessons learned for future orbital flights or point-to-point -point travel? So the spaceship and the Virgin Galactic experience are kind of trying to help open space for people, open access and democratizing space uh, for, for, all, for all of us. So then the other side of this, kind of where do we fit in? So a lot of people have been following Virgin Galactic for, for years. Uh, about two years ago, we did spin off Virgin Orbit as its own company. So Virgin Orbit is, there, we're sister companies. Virgin Orbit is based in Long Beach, uh, outside of LA. And they have about 600 people now um, building what they call the Launcher One. So it's the same sort of heritage as Spaceship. So we have Air Launch, drop a rocket, and this is really geared towards small satellites. And Vox Space, we started that at the same time. So we spun Vox Space off to be able to focus on uh, government activities. So we, we really work ma mainly with the US national security space community. So that's kind of a fun bridge uh, to be able to work that business model, which as you heard from Robbie and some of the others earlier, isn't necessarily straightforward. Um, so for us to have a dedicated team to work on that, we really see as kind of best of both worlds. So from this element, what is Launcher One? So here we go. Same sort of architecture again, we're air launching. Um, so this is, and we have our own dedicated 747 for this activity. So just like Spaceship and White Knight, um, so what we do here is the 747 takes off just like an airplane and goes up to about 35,000 feet and over, over open ocean and drops the rocket. The rocket falls for about five seconds before it ignites and then poof, off it goes. Um, we're delivering payloads into low Earth orbit right now. The rocket is expendable, uh, but obviously the 747 is not. We, we do bring that back. Um, so it's a pretty flexible system. So this chart, I just actually found this from some local news. I wanna actually just kind of let this soak in for a second. Right, so this was back in October when we first mated the Launcher One onto the 747 just for its initial fit checks before we flew it. This is just done at a commercial airport. This is just on the north edge of the flight line at Long Beach um, where we're mounting a rocket onto an airplane. So let's think about some of the themes we've heard today in terms of really opening up access to space and what is that infrastructure layer not just for the people, but for, for the small satellites so we can enable people to meet their milestones, meet their schedules, have more control over what they're telling investors they'll be able to get their satellite on orbit by X date. So this is really gonna change the concept of what is a launch operation, what is required for a launch operation, and where can you conduct a launch operation. Um, so this is, I, I just thought that was pretty cool. Um, I also kind of really like in this to, we talked about this earlier today too, but the internet, right? So when everybody started unrolling all of the apps for the internet, nobody really knew what that end state would look like. So once we're really able to launch on a schedule and you can reconfigure your manifest or your timelines, just like you can change your flight uh, from, from Boston to LA on a whim, what will that do? How will that help enable this ecosystem to realize business models in a different way? We don't really know. And then also on the national security side, there's all, all, of course tons of talk of resiliency. How can you make things more resilient? Disaggregation is a big part of that. Making things more, whoa, making things more proliferated is another element of that. And where that's an interesting uh, change to the calculus as well is because then if things are proliferated, they are disaggregated, you can really kind of have it be a deterrent effect, right? So it's a way to almost be, a calming presence by having more stuff that you're dealing with in Leo. 
Uh, so this is a recent picture towards the end of 2018. We did finally get into flight test, which is super exciting. So this is getting very real. Um, so we've flown with the rocket on the 747 now three times. The first time was pretty low and slow, just make sure everything's good. And then the second two flights were both five and a half, six hours long. Um, really went through a lot more flutter testing, stall testing, starting to really exercise the design. So this is super exciting. Even went through some of the maneuvers that the aircraft will have to go through, which is pretty energetic for a 747. So it's pretty exciting. Um, just some other recent pictures and recent events. Another, I kind of like both of these on the bottom. They're kind of interesting also to show that, that mobility operation and how responsive and mobile can a launch operation be. So this, this is the payload trailer. So rather than having the classic dedicated buildings along the Cape and at Vandenberg, we have a trailer that we can move around to any airfield. So this can really change how you can design your missions, operate your missions, um, be robust against changes. So again, what, what is the ecosystem that we can really enable here? And how do we normalize that space access and, and blend these missions? Another thing that came up through the day is really kind of what is, what is government, what is commercial, especially in terms of, we, we saw that in some of Blue Origin's remarks on the exploration side. And the same is true with commerce, the same is true with, with communications, the same can be true with, with classic EO, uh, data collection, weather, et cetera. So how can we really start blending these business models and make it more efficient for everybody? And I totally agree with what Robbie said in his talks earlier in terms of you don't want to just be a, have one customer that is the government. You need to have a blend. But at the same time, of, of course, you're going to need to service that market as well. So what are those business models to make it easier for companies like us to work with them, enable us to still stay nimble and provide things as a service more affordably to everybody? So it's really kind of changing what is that business model as well. Um, so and I think like one, and I think I only had one more chart. Yeah, there we go. So this was again the first time we ever had had the rocket mounted onto the airplane, and Richard Branson really talks. One quote from him recently says, "Your lives will be transformed by space, and we are we are all in this together." And you know we really think that that's true. And so from both the human perspective and the small set perspective, this is really kind of the roadmap for the near term. So some of our near-term activities that you'll see, um, so we've seen, we've been in captive carry already. You'll see some more flights. Uh, we'll, and we'll be having our first flight here later this year. And what we really hope to demonstrate with this is, is the mobility of that launch operation. We'll fly out of Mojave, same place that spaceship flies for the near term for first few missions. And then we're also exploring other locations, both internationally, domestically, and what can, what can even sovereign launch look look like. We've had other customers, both commercially and on the government side, say, hey, how can, can you come here and launch our satellite on our soil versus us having to ship satellites all over the place? What if we just ship the launch site, right? So there's all sorts of new business models and new launch concepts that we'd like to explore with this. I'm surprised there's no questions yet. Um, let's see. What were some of the other themes? And one thing that we're also working for from the commerce perspective and from the business models, we're very fortunate that, uh, so I support the Space Council on the Users Advisory Group as well. And a big part of that, both from the education and outreach perspective, um, so working exactly forums like this in terms of how can we, and there's an extensive outreach activity that Virgin, Virgin Orbit, Virgin Galactic, and, and all of the Virgin companies themselves have through what they call Virgin Unite and Galactic Unite, um, where we're really emphasizing STEM and, and diversity in the workplace as well. And then the other hat that I wear there with the Space Council is on the national security side to where it's like, okay, what is that business model? How can you on-ramp these capabilities uh, and enable the national security space community to leverage the prospects that are coming from this new space and this new space ecosystem, not just small satellites, but the whole new space entrepreneurial community writ large. Yes, sir. Right. 
potentially mitigate some of that? Does it open up a broader market for you guys? What it, what no, and we certainly have the same limitations too in terms of what we can what we can fly, right? So we're we're beholden to ITAR certainly. Um, and one thing that we're we're working on, both on Launcher One and on the spaceship side, is what is truly ITAR about the system itself. And a big part of that is like, you know what, the rocket's pretty easy to make sure that that's kind of contained within US control the whole time. Where we get into some creative, we're having, we have a very good dialogue going with, with state and with commerce on this, uh, is what, how do you classify the aircraft? Because as of right now, both the White Knight and the 747 are considered MCTR, even when they're not flying hardware. So that really is limiting. Um, so again, there's ways you can get around that just through operations to say, OK, we're going to just make sure that we're maintaining a US control boundary around the system. But we, we are working to say, OK, can we really reevaluate what is MCTR about the carrier aircraft themselves? So and again, you know, it's, it's a lot of bureaucratic paperwork. We know it'll take a while. But we are at least encouraged that we're having the discussion, which is good. Yes, sir. Sure. Can you say what the max gross weight of the launcher is and the payload gross? Uh, the launcher one itself, or the, la the, the launcher of the spaceship? You just need to get questions. Oh, sure. Oh, you got it. Okay. Can you say what the max gross weight of the launcher and then the payload, the max payload? Oh, yeah. So the launcher one itself weighs 57,000 pounds when it's fueled. And uh, so two design reference missions for performance. We can get 300 kilograms to a 500 kilometer sun sink or closer to about 500 kilograms to an equatorial orbit. So it still is definitely small sat focused at this point, but more we can carry more than just, just CubeSats, right? So it is a decent, and the payload fairing is, is fairly large for a small launch vehicle. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. So, the, oh, do I need a, my app? so given if, if that there's a common connector for payloads to the vehicle within the fairing, uh, I'm some government agency, I need to launch a 250 kilogram, you know, some payload. What is the plan as far as how rapidly can you get that payload to launch? From the time they call and mm -hmm. say, we need this ASAP, what right. do you envision three, four years out you'll be able to do that? I'm in? glad you put the qualifier on there. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> so, no, three, three or four years out, if the payload is, is ready to go, we really envision this being able to turn like an airplane turns. Um, so we would like to be able, so even now, uh, our baseline for operations is things don't get, we, we don't enter hazardous ops until about three or four hours before we actually take off. So if you have the payload ready to go, uh, in theory, we could turn this around in less than eight hours, which is pretty exciting. Well, if I could follow on then with a, so yes. Okay. Question yeah. then, um, you know, mission design, mm -hmm. licensing, those don't happen in 72 right. hours. Correct. So your constraints may be coming from those sorts of things, right? Absolutely. Okay. And that's one where, um, like, I'm, you, some of you may be familiar with the DARPA launch challenge that they're that they're supporting. So that's one of the key things that I'd like to see come out of that program is the government to government work that's happening behind the scenes to address that concern. How can you get the FAA to, to move faster than on a 180-day cycle time? Um, you know, we've kind of likened it to, it's like, okay, you can have pre-planned flight corridors or pre-planned flight paths for what you think some of those payloads may be that you would need to launch on a short time and then just call it at the last minute. So that to me, I mean, it's, that's way less of a technical problem than a regulatory problem, but you're exactly right. So that's where I, I do see something like the, the DARPA launch challenge. That could be one of the key leave behinds from that challenge. Yes, sir. I have a question here. Oh, Hi. Yeah. Yes, um, I have a question. I'm working together with uh, JPL, NASA, the Department of Planetary Defense, and uh, we're having a large effort to actually keep uh, payload and cargo in general like uh, bacteria and microorganism free. Cool. And mm -hmm. um, um, we are an expert right now for low input sequencing. So we actually swapping the Mars rover. I did it myself, it was amazing. But the thing is like how this will be incorporated in all these new new companies, right? Because uh, there is a safety issues. 
for example, looking for right now, we already know that we contaminated Mars and Moon with spores mm -hmm. because we know that spores can survive space. Mm -hmm. What is your strategy here? Just in terms of contamination control in general? Exactly. Oh, you know, that's for the first few missions, not that great, um, but I'm just kidding. But no, we're actually, we're working with NASA and we're working with some commercial companies that have this concern. They want to fly uh, live experiments. So it's twofold. It kind of goes back to your point too, in terms of how can we handle late payload integration, especially if it is something that is biological. Uh, and then one, one thing we can do, the payload trailer itself is clean cleanish, and uh, if we need to encapsulate something that needs to be even more tightly contained than that, encapsulate in a higher rated clean room, and then put the, the payload fairing into the trailer for mating with the rocket. So we can stage the integration activity to make sure that, that things that really require contamination control can be controlled. And the whole payload fairing and the rest of the system from that point on, we've got nitrogen purge and air conditioning and all that kind of stuff. So that way the, the payload fairing is maintained in a, in a good environment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, during experience, we saw that uh, one of the main containment risks was like, like, like late add-ups to this payload. For example, an iPad was actually the source of main contamination then, mm, okay. which we found. So the point is wow. like that. Um, it's really like like you really have a good strategy and you have to start early because you have to incorporate it. Mm -hmm. But at, at some time right now, we're thinking there will be soon regulations coming up. So if you not address them now, you're going to be le too Great late point. later. Okay. Get trade. He's our mission manager. So it's like, get a card. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> just second question. So um, I'm looking at that plane mm -hmm. and... I actually saw a Lufthansa 747 the other day. Okay. You know, they're getting, right. they're phasing out. Yep. So, uh, especially keeping, yeah, the passenger versions are phasing out. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, maintaining an aircraft that has basically been discontinued has got to be ex pricey. So is, the, <laughs> right, right. so, is the future possibly on another type of aircraft? For the near term, n no, because while the passenger versions are being phased out, the cargo versions are not yet. So they're still they're still making the cargo version uh, of the 747. So awareness to work on them, parts, support, we think will be around for quite a while. And you know, truthfully, could could we move to another aircraft in the future? Sure. But we do see that there is, because they are still being manufactured, um, there's going to be support for quite a while. And it is one where it's such a well-known airframe and such a well-known aircraft, being able to, f to find help and operate it globally is, is really easy to do. Yeah, I was going to say, Boeing's still making brand new right. 747s. It's very popular. Yep. Uh, for, for cargo. Yep. So I wonder if the cargo version, uh, does it have a tail? hatch it doesn't but there's the nose hatch some of them do so you could put your launch integration trailer inside, inside. the plane basically the whole thing is literally a flying spaceport no. so the, your your yep. rocket is that solid no this is liquid really yep makes it super but, easy but that's well for, but from that's, my perspective <laughs> is that air air yeah. is that considered air transportable as freight I mean, could you carry spares mm -hmm. on fuel? Well, okay, so that begs the question. So where do you get the fuel from? <laughs> right. right, right. So no, it's locks the RP. So we're, yeah, it's locks, oh, locks and RP. RP. Oh, that's not that big a deal. Okay. <laughs> yeah, good systems. I mean, the Russians man mastered yeah. it <laughs> 60 years ago. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. So my question is on a slightly different note, mm -hmm. uh, or actually a really different note. I'm curious around the business side. So if, in a attempt to diversify your client base, you know, aside from government organizations, uh, research organizations, what do you see as the biggest target market sectors that your company will try to target so that you have increased uh, not only market, but also more opportunities to kind of maintain the pipeline. Oh, absolutely. Uh, no, and that's where, from my perspective at Vox Space, um, as a subsidiary company, we're really solely focused on, on the government side. But the mothership of Virgin Orbit, they're, we're only looking to probably be maybe like 25%-ish of, of their market share, right? So it really is, the business base is commercial. 
So between all the other companies that have been repre what's that? You know, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you've got companies like OneWeb. They're a great example. Um, constellations like OneWeb are an interesting example because they're, they need to put up so many satellites quickly. So, sure, they're going to use big rockets for that. That's way more cost effective. But for now, in this early 1Z, 2Z phase, it makes sense to use a smaller ride when you really need schedule, as well as replenishment or maintenance. Uh, so that's where we really see that gosh, between communications, companies like Planet doing, basically wanting to instrument the whole world and observe it, there's gonna constantly need to be a, const, uh, a replenishment factor, a maintenance factor, where this sort of capability is really attractive. Yeah, it's exciting. Yes, sir. Yeah, so along similar lines, I was just curious, in the next like five to 10 years, do you guys have a product development timeline and where do you see the cost per kilogram uh, going? as you're developing new rockets and things like that. Are you allowed to say that? Uh, <laughs> I can't for what for this. Um, so, you know, for what, well, and basically like the whole market is kind of in, it is where it is, right? So between, if you're, if you're a small satellite like Planet riding on, a, on one of the larger launch vehicles, the prices are anywhere from, from 10,000 to 30,000 a kilogram. And for the dedicated rides, uh, not just us, but a lot of the other emerging players are between the thirty and forty thousand dollar a kilogram. So it is it is a little more expensive than um, than than a ride share. But then the trade is that certainty, right? The flexibility and the certainty. And then the other thing too is is getting to a, a more regular flight cadence. And then that's where in the future, kind of an analogy I like to use really is the airline, right? It's like, okay, you can fly first class from Boston to London tonight, but it'll cost you. Uh, or you can, you know, wait a little bit and go and have a cheaper airfare. Or do you want to go first class or do you want to fly coach? Um, so how can, we, what's the analogy? What's the analogy on this when we're really, I'd like to really be able to drag and drop seat assignments with, with satellites just as easily as an airline can with passengers. Um, so I think that would be fun. That doesn't exist yet. Um, but that's certainly a more dynamic pricing market that I think, I think will emerge once this, as well as some of the others, start to increase their flight cadence. Yes, sir. Uh, so economics aside, um, and just focus on the physics, I'm, I'm not a rocket person. Um, can you educate me on what the limits of, of the airplane um, rocket model are like how many of these could you fit on a single plane um, how many uh, at what point does does it stop making sense at what point does it start making sense um, well and just okay so I'll just start with just kind of air launch in general right why do this versus just a traditional ground launch and it really and the, is and the issue of expendability is part of that exactly yeah. right and so it, it really is kind of six of one half dozen of the other in terms of air launch versus ground launch darpa did a study a few years ago that came out i think really overly optimistic on the energy that you you benefit from on the air launch side but so okay while you're getting above a lot of the atmosphere so in theory your engines have to have can be more efficient you have other structural concerns like a pull-up maneuver. So it's really kind of, it kind of washes that out. So from a pure physics, ground versus air, the real benefit is, is the flexibility. So it's the flexibility as well as it is like less of an impact on your, um, the environmental impact of the launch site itself, right? Because like, like we mentioned, it's, lock, it's basically jet fuel and, and liquid oxygen, and then we fly away so we don't have weird mixes of fuels and construction happening at a launch pad uh, that a traditional ground launch has. Can the, the airplane, the 747 though, to second to build onto that, um, it can carry a lot. <laughs> so we actually, this is nothing for a 747. So there's, there's room to grow. There's, there's room to grow the rocket a little bit in each dimension and still fit at this point on the wing. Um, the 747 physically could lift too. We did not modify this plane to do that, um, but you, you, could do, you could lift too if you wanted, which would be really freaky looking. I think it'd be pretty cool, but yeah, you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, so right now you and everyone else is selling or making the rockets and selling the service of launching them. Is it a matter of time where the there's an rocket airline and then manufacturers are separate or is there some appeal to having both? Um, for the, good question. 
and we'll see where it goes because just like a lot of the, the the big classic defense contractors, they were very vertically integrated and then they wanted to just step back and be into the integrator role. Maybe we'll see that in the future, but for the near term, while we're trying to establish the baseline and then get to rate, um, it's kind of, it's really almost the SpaceX model of controlling your fate while you're in that early startup phase. So, and I know, you know, we've ended up making a lot of make buy decisions um, and our uh, similar, similar new entrants have too. Um, where when you're trying to do something for the first time, you, you need to have more control over your own um, supply chain. So will that stay that way forever? We'll see, right? So I, w I could see that going either way. Yes, sir. Are you working on uh, possible payloads that would be for enabled for reentry, like pharmaceutical process or zero gravity stuff? Or yes, in yes, addition absolutely. To the one way? I think yeah, pharmaceutical is a great example. Um, and no, there's been some other more fun ideas too. Uh, but pharmaceutical, I think, is is kind of a, a good design reference mission that we're definitely thinking about. And you know, there's material science to be gained too, right? So bringing something back has a lot of value. Other questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. I oh. can just speak on five. So in terms of the <laughs> He's like, oh, no. Got to get it all. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Um, to bring it back to economics, I'm sorry. Sure. So from the, the space tourism side, mm -hmm. thinking about demand, you know, right now, obviously, like, there's a long wait list for, for stuff like this. But when that kind of evens out and the, the rich space enthusiasts have, have gone up, where do you think that demand will lie? And do you think there are still like not enough players in this space or too many? Do you mean in terms of uh, other companies to yes. fly? Oh, sure. Um, well, you know, I think the airlines, again, are kind of a fun example there, right? So at first, it may seem, oh, how many players, how many people can afford this ride and how many players do we really need? Are we saturating the market? Maybe, but then also the flight rate's not going to be super rapid either when these when this is new. And, you know, then I, another example that I think is, a, is kind of a fun one to kind of compare this to is, you know, okay, climbing Mount Everest really used to be only that very tiny numbers of mountaineers and now, I mean, it's, climbing Everest is still very expensive and very hard, um, but it's like, you know what, it, that's a much more achievable excursion for people to go on. And, you know, there's just, ski the last degree is a vacation I would love to do on Antarctica, right? But it's like, so there's a different level of, of uh, adventure tourism that I think exists out there um, that who would have thought that this many people would climb Everest in a year, right? So I think that's kind of an interesting analogy. It's like, you know what, I think if when there's enough flight rate and who knows where the prices will really go, I think it'll be definitely more accessible and more achievable. Yes, sir. What is the span time to construct the launcher now, and what could it be if you hit right. your flight rate you want? Oh, sure. Um, the span time, the lead time to build a launcher one now is just like any other rocket, you're really driven by how fast can you make a thrust chamber and some of the metallic components that make a rocket engine. And I'll channel our vice president of propulsion development for Virgin Orbit. He's like, I don't care who you are. It's nine months to make a thrust chamber. <laughs> Your Aerojet, SpaceX, whoever, just because it's a lot of metal and you've got to go through the plating and all the machining. Um, so it's that's it's slow right now from that perspective. And but then that's where we're really excited with a lot of the new additive manufacturing methods. Uh, not so much. Um, even the DMLS printing, but there's a lot of the direct energy deposition systems that are show really promising, where you get a lot more of the constitutive properties of the metal, so you can make larger structures. There's a company in LA, Relativity Space. They're trying to basically 3D print the whole rocket, which is pretty cool. Um, so open air, metallic 3D printing of all of the tough bits. So I think advances in those technologies will, will totally change the production flow. Um, for, for all of us, for the whole industry. Okay, I got the mic. Um, so to leverage off of the question mm -hmm. from the young lady there, but thinking more towards these, the newly emerging very small launch vehicles. You know, you guys are in the lead, or 
right behind the leader, mm -hmm. and there's a couple others that are there with you, but there's like a hundred others that are in the wings. Right. So at some point, there's going to be a shakeout, or as some people Absolutely. say, the bubble's going to burst. Yeah. And in the end, based on where what you're seeing as far as market interest, how many companies do you think are going to, to survive in the end? It'd be economically viable. Right. No, I think, what well, was it last count? There's like 110 <laughs> small, small launch companies emerging around the world. So certainly not all of them, right? Um, if we were the only company in this size, I'd be worried, right? But the fact that people do think that this is interesting and the price points are kind of all converging, I think we're, we're finding the, the right point of the market. I think there's definitely room for more than one. I think there's prob def probably room for more than three. Um, but I don't think 50. Right. So it's um, and then also then where where do the international players come in versus domestic? Um, so, you know, we've got we're, we're watching competitors emerge from from all over the world, not just Europe, but China as well and Japan. And so it's um, there's I think definitely that'll kind of create a larger playing field uh, from the international interests as well. Yes, sir. I actually have two questions, but over one. Um, the first one is around the capacity of the 747. Obviously, it can carry a hell of a lot more of a yeah. payload. Can you discuss some of the things that you thought about doing with the extra capacity? And then the second one is around the competition, to follow up on this. How, um, what are you doing, if anything, to try to protect your IP so that a dozen other companies don't try to do the same? Right. Um, well, let's see. With the 747, how much can it carry? What could we do? So, uh, like I mentioned, we can go a little bigger and still fit under the wing like this. So there definitely is is room to grow in every dimension a little bit. So we can increase performance that way. Uh, then if, if you want to go significantly larger than that, you, you really need to move to the top of the aircraft, um, a la shuttle. And so you can definitely carry a lot of weight on top. So that's kind of a cool far way farther out kind of idea but that's if you need to, to really get heavy that's you'd have to move to the top um and then what was your your second question oh the ip well i mean just like any commercial development right so it's like just we own the ip for what is the interface to the 747 um so it's between the the pylon the interface what was the modification done to the aircraft so that that was our design Yep. Other other questions? Cool. Good questions. Yeah, sure. thank thank you. So no this is a yeah, I think a what was the other Richard Branson quote that we have have on our wall like screw it, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just one kind of fun tidbit on kind of how we ended up here. Uh, Launcher 1 was first designed to fly on the White Knight. So we've got the spaceship that goes onto the White Knight carrier aircraft. So it's like, well, it's not going to fly the spaceship all the time. We're, let's launch satellites too. So they had initially baselined the vehicle to fly on that. And then through the course of the propulsion development program, ended up with more, a uh, more powerful engine than rocket on White Knight needs. So it was really kind of a weird back end into what is the design like, okay, well, how much engine do we have? How big of a rocket can that push uphill? What airplane fits around it? So it was a, a really interesting <clears throat> trade to end up with this baseline. But I think in the end, and we end up with a much more flexible platform. And then both companies have their own dedicated asset as well, which is exciting. Yes, ma'am. Uh, did you have a video of how it might work? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I'd love to see yeah sure. Um, um, yeah, and if you even just on the YouTube channel. You know, so both the, yeah, the Virgin Orbit ha YouTube channel has great videos of how it is and, and will work. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks. You.